Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the North Dallas Plano. I'm sorry. We'll give, you know, good afternoon. Welcome to Interviewing Wednesdays. I don't know. It's one of these sessions. What day of the week is it? I'm not really sure. <laughs> it's Wednesday. Thank you for being with us today. It's July 14th, 2021. Uh, for those people on Zoom, if you have questions, please open up the chat box and just put your questions into the comment field, into the chat box. And for those on Facebook watching, you can just enter your comments into the uh, comment field, and I am monitoring that feed, and I'll be sure to get those questions answered for you. Please note this event is being recorded and is currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, and if you post a comment in the, uh, if you have your microphone or camera on, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note the comments that you do put in the Zoom chat window will not appear in the recording. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in, I think it is anyway. Uh, back in 2008, I started a website called Career DFW to help those who were unemployed in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I started a second website in 2012, CareerUSA.org, to help people outside the Dallas Fort Worth area. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search You May Not Know. It is available on Amazon. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. The group's been around since the late 1990s, and I'll tell you about our upcoming programming this Friday at the end of this session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team, and you'll hear more about that here in just a second. Well, we've got uh, two presenters who are going to talk all about information interviewing, and they put together this 13-part workshop, Mark McDonald and Walt Glass. So, uh, gentlemen, I'll let you introduce yourselves. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about what's available to you as a job seeker and a little bit about my background as well. So uh, I lead the practice interview team and have been doing that since uh, 2014. And I got started a year before that. Uh, with as a volunteer, you know, as a panelist providing the interviews. Uh, and that was right after I got laid off for the third time from the telecommunications equipment market. So these, most of these companies are not around anymore, but it used to be that they made specialized electronics for the phone companies like Verizon and AT&T to provide service to your home or your office. And um, it's been an industry that started shrinking in, uh, the, with the recession in early 2000. And so that, between then and 2012, I got laid off three times. So I, but I got involved in the pit crew and used that experience to, uh, you know, bring encouragement, frankly, uh, all those layoffs and all the people that got laid off along with me uh, found viable employment. And uh, even, you know, during those recessionary times when the layoffs occurred. And so I come with a lot of confidence that you can find employment well as well and I focus on helping you interview well. So that's what the pick crew is about, the practice interview team. We give a very personalized and customized interview experience based on a job description that you provide and of course your resume. So we have a group of volunteers. I have a group of volunteers. They've all been hiring managers and they've all been in through or in, currently in job transition. So. We're also very empathetic to your situation and provide a safe and supportive environment for you to come and practice interviewing and learn how to interview better through that practice. So I encourage you to practice early and practice often. The more you practice, the better you will be at it. The more, um, uh, what's I wanna say, uh, challenges you'll face during the practice interviews that are gonna come up in your real interviews and you'll be you know, prepared and confident that you can handle those. So when you're ready to practice, just send your information, that's your resume and job description that you picked out to dallaspitcrew at gmail.com. And I say a job description that you picked out because it doesn't have to be an opportunity that you're already pursuing. It might be your dream job description, just something to practice against so you can build your skills, find out where you may need some improvement and find out where you're doing well so you don't have to be concerned about that. So that's what the pick crew is about. Practice, practice, practice. So practice early, practice often. I There's my LinkedIn profile and I'm gonna put it in uh, the chat window. So there's the information for the Dallas Pit Crew email address and my LinkedIn profile. And I just encourage you to send me a note 
when you uh, asked the link in that said we met on interview Wednesdays, and so I have a place where we met, and uh, I'll add you to my network, which of course is going to help you with your informational interviewing, finding contacts inside your car, your target companies, and informational interviewing, which is today's topic. The pit crew also has one other way to help you out, and that is one-way interviews. So this is a thing. It's, I guess it started in 2020, where you get a series of questions that you uh, record, video recording. Sometimes the tool does it. Sometimes I saw last week somebody was asked to make a recording. Okay, so there were six or seven questions. Record yourself on your phone answering these questions and send it in to us. So, uh, but the pit crew offering is a professional tool. So it's called Easy Hire. It's a tool that companies use to provide to you know manage their informational their one-way interviews, I'm sorry. And so we've got access to it through Jeff's effort as a uh, donation. And I can give you an opportunity to practice that. The way the pit crew works is, is we're, I'm mainly focused on helping you practice. So I give you the questions in advance, you know what they are, you can prepare for them. And then you get a chance to interact with the tool to see what it's really like. And once you get started, you just get a link to go to the tools application. And after that, there's very little involvement for me. Uh, you'll get a you'll get a second link with the, your recording after you're done, and you can share that if you choose to share it. But you don't have to. Nobody else will see it. So that's the way it goes. Four questions, uh, questions you're likely to be asked in every interview. You'll get them in, in advance, and you can prepare and deliver them. So that's the one way interview. And then finally, I told you there was some things on offer here. Finally, I. I uh, do coaching, but I just coach on one topic, and that is why did you leave your last job? So, and it may not be your last job. I had a session earlier this week, and we, we ended up reviewing the entire career to see what the themes were inside the career to help explain some job transitions. And so, it might be something in your past that, that you're concerned about or is confusing or difficult to talk about. Let's have a conversation, a confidential conversation about how to cover that. So just reach out to me at dallaspitcrew at gmail.com and we'll schedule that session as well. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Uh, good afternoon, Walt. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Would you like to interview without the fear of death? Would you like to have an interview where you don't have to be so concerned and stressed out and have a lot of anxiety? Well, that's the kind of coaching that I offer through the Interview Success Workshop. It's a free workshop. You need to be registered to attend. So what we do is we cover the 11 basic categories of questions and we learned how to sell who we are, what we do, and how we can help. Had a couple of interviews yesterday and any, there was nothing in either one's responses about how they could help. So we covered that in detail and coached how we could actually get that inside of our interview responses. It's a great thing to do. And you also want to learn how to differentiate yourself from those other candidates, how to be memorable. How will someone remember you? For those of you that have interviewed in the past, you know it's kind of hard sometimes to pick out a candidate because they're kind of all getting mixed up. Well, how can we be the one that stands out from all the rest? So that's the kind of thing I focus on. And I do it in a very informal environment. I usually do it on Tuesdays from 10 to 12. Look me up on the about section of my LinkedIn page and give you some more details about how the process works. But we can have some fun while we're learning. It doesn't have to be all that bad, right? That's why you come and practice so that you can get better. And so I'll be, be glad to help you do that. So sign up, call, send me an email. I'll give you some availability dates. <clears throat> you can get online with me and we'll have some learning without squirming. Well, thank you very, very much. All right. Well, today is session number 11, all about informational interviews. So, gentlemen, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. You guys see that now? Thanks, Jeff. Should see full, you should see my mine and Walt's picture. Yep. All right, good. Let's get started. So today is all about informational interviews, session 11 and Really, this is the uh, Walt Glass informational interview webinar with an introduction by Mark McDonald. So <laughs> there we go. I'm going to just have a few slides and try to put this into context. 
what remember, you know, top line or the subtitle here is how to shorten your job search. So how to shorten your job search through informational interviews. All right, so here's all 13 sessions and we are on session number 11. And I wanna show this because if you're new, uh, all 13 sessions are available on the Career USA YouTube channel, and you can look at them in any order. When we, Walt and I first put this together, uh, we were assuming that you were brand new. So the first five are for people who are brand new to the job search and cover just the topic of how to prepare to interview, how to be prepared, how to be well prepared for an interview. And there's quite a few things that you need to do there. Uh, then the next group of five is all about effective interviewing. And uh, so we just wrapped that up last week and there's some good things in there about asking questions and demonstrating enthusiasm and building rapport. And then this last group of three, which will take us through the rest of July, uh, informational interviews today and dealing with difficult interviewers next week. And then the last week, uh, the last Wednesday of July, avoiding common interview mistakes, call it interview crashes. So those will be coming up. Uh, but like I said, if you're concerned about any one of these particular topics, you can go to the Career USA YouTube channel and find the same content in the same order that Walt and I did in January, February, and March. And uh, take a look at those. You can look at them in any order, whatever will help you the most. All right, so here's, uh, I have think three or four slides, and I'm going to start with the very busiest one. You may take a look at that and digest it for a second. Oh, I forgot to do something. So while you guys are thinking about this, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, when we used to meet face to face, it was a very interactive session. And when we, when we, you know, talked about interviewing, after all the interviews were done, we had a little education session and people would ask questions. And so we just talked about whatever was on their mind. And so now, before we start with our each weekly presentation, I'd like to hear what's on your mind. So uh, specifically about informational interviewing, but if there's any other topic that you'd like to hear about, we'll cover that if we have time. So please go ahead and put those in the chat window. Uh, and you can put them in there anytime, but let's just take, you know, a 30 seconds or so to get you guys started and put in there what uh, you'd like for us to cover, what concerns you may have about informational interviewees, what questions you wanna make sure or uh, that we cover or what topics we cover. Go ahead and put those in there. And uh, then you can take a look at this very busy slide. What are, you, what are you playing in the background there, Joe? Hey, Jeopardy. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any questions there? Oh, here we go. Addressing family caregiver gaps in the interview. Okay, we can cover that. Best to get LinkedIn Plus to reach out to people for info interviews. Oh, okay. LinkedIn Plus, okay. I'm making a note here so we can come back and find these. All right, well, thanks for those questions. And if you think of a, you know, if another question occurs to you, go ahead and put it in the chat window whenever it occurs. We will have some breaks where we, you know, pause to answer questions and, uh, We'll, we'll approach those then, or we'll, we'll push them off to the end. But we'll, uh, one way or another, we'll get you an answer to your question. And there's one more. Let me write that one down, just a timestamp. All right, so this is a very busy slide, but this is the whole picture. And one of the things that occurs to me, well, for, <laughs> for quite a while, for two or three years at least, I have, been trying to figure out why people don't avail themselves of informational interviews more often. And, uh, you know, somebody's asked a question, it's kind of difficult for them, and certainly they can be challenging. Walt's going to 
you know, take you through all the steps. Um, but I wanted to, at a very high level, you know, explain the motivation behind informational interviews. And they, they may still be a little bit tricky for you, but the payoff is tremendous. And so that's what this next few slides talk about. So you'll see on these slides, a little green car. That's you, the race driver and the pit crew. And we're gonna take you around this circle. And along the way, we're gonna talk about informational interviews and, and a very small about, about networking and target companies. Uh, then we're going to talk about the benefit you get uh, over here on the other side when it comes time to apply for the job and what happens with the black hole and becoming a preferred candidate and having more effective interviews as a result of your informational interviewing. One thing I want to cover on this slide is I always keep in mind, I think this is a good um, statistic, right here this uh, text right here, job posting statistics. So this is for jobs that are posted. And in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about the hidden job market and tell you how big it is. But for the, for Suvisa for now, it's several times bigger. The hidden job market is several times bigger than the posted job market. Okay, so all these numbers get expanded when you start considering uh, the hidden job market. But for posted jobs, 30% of them are filled internally. And if you've been in the job search for a while, you've probably encountered this where uh, the recruiter or the HR person lets you know that the internal candidate filled the role. So that's not your imagination, that's a thing. A large number of job postings eventually become filled by internal candidates. And the data that I got this from was like 30%, so a little bit less than one third. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, 40% of job postings are filled by internal recruiters. These are recruiters who work for the company using their first and second degree connections. So this is people who they've talked to themselves, maybe on the phone, maybe face to face, uh, but also second degree referrals to the recruiter, which is an employee who brings someone forward as a good candidate for a position. So that's 40% of the posted jobs. And then another 10% of the posted jobs are filled by the internal recruiter from their applicant tracking system or from a database like LinkedIn, whatever they use, but a database, you know, and this is where your information goes, the applicant tracking system black hole, we call it, because you have about a 2% chance of being contacted if that's all you do is apply and put your information into the, into the database. But a fair number of placements, um, do originate or end up coming out of that black hole, it's just pretty low probability that you among the other 100 or 150 applicants for a particular job uh, get the call or even, and even get an opportunity to participate in the interviews. And then about 20% are filled by agency recruiters. These are recruiters outside of the company and they, they, you know, they have their similar techniques, their first and second degree connections and their own, some of them have their own databases. And so now if you just, if you take out the ones that are filled internally, right? If you just remove those, what this says is about two thirds of job postings are filled by internal recruiters, by company recruiters. And so it's important to get inside a company and that's what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, so one of your goals of networking is to find the hidden job market. So you, when you meet people, you're going to introduce yourself. You may use your um, elevator story, um, and so we call I call those contacts. They're they're just people you've met. Maybe a large number of the people you know on LinkedIn, you don't know that well. They're just contacts. You don't know if they'd be willing to help you or not. Um, you meet a lot of people, you're gonna find some people though that you kind of naturally have a connection with. You may have something in common. They may be people from your church. They may be people in your children's activities. Uh, you know, they may, may be the book club. You know, they may be th things that you do. And uh, people who have a connection with you, uh, something in common, uh, are more willing to help you. It's just the way it is, okay? And there's kind of different 
strengths in this because um, you know connections or champions or supporters they all basically mean the same thing uh, but over time you can nurture those connections and they become even stronger and stronger i mean so they really begin to work for you right they really want to help you find a job because you have this thing in common you have a uh, you've built up some rapport and so you have to go through a lot of contacts to you know find a fair number of connections who will help you out but the payoff's pretty big those kinds of connections um give you access to the hidden job market. And I wanna use this slide to talk about how big the hidden job market is, best I can tell, and you'll see widely varying numbers. The best I can tell, it's about three times the size of the posted job market. And let me, let me just give you an example, a couple of examples, but in one example, the first one here is from my background, and, and uh, we typically had a calendar year financial planning year in September, we would start planning for the next year. And of course, part of that planning was how many new people we're going to hire. And so we might put together a plan and all these plans are contingent upon continued financial performance, right? So we put together a plan for the next year. And so let's say we were decided we were gonna grow the engineering team. And so the first quarter we'd hire three, second three, you know, we'd hire a dozen new engineers next year, uh, three per quarter contingent upon continuing to do well, right? If the financials change, then that plan could change, uh, but either up or down, right? It could, there might be some management reserve there for a couple of other people if things go well. And of course, there'll be a cutback in new hiring if things don't go so well. Now, December comes along and we've got this plan now to hire three new engineers in, in January, February, or March. And so three postings go out, okay? Now there's some data behind this, right? It's not just uh, we're going to hire, you know, 12 engineers. There's a description of what they're going to work on, what we, what kind of background we need. So that's all part of the strategic plan. And so a candidate shows up for one of those three jobs. Not really a good match for any of those three, but could be and maybe is a match for one that's planned a little farther down in the year. And if you're you are a really strong candidate, those hidden jobs uh, available, but nobody knows about them except for a small number of people uh, become a available job for, for you. Now they may, you know, because of corporate governance, if a good candidate comes up and they want to accelerate the hiring process, they may still have to post the job, uh, but you arrived, you triggered the event that opened up that job and for you, it was completely hidden. So that's one way uh, that there's a lot of, positions available but aren't advertised. And so one reason I say three times, I think the hidden job market is approximately three times the posted job market. Another uh, example is sort of a, a short-term event, right? So um, for instance, I was talking to a candidate today who applied for a job and I asked them, well, how did you find out about this job? And they found out through one of their professional organizations. And so the way it happened was the company was looking for a certain, I can't remember now what it was, but a certain skill set. And so they called the organization, the local Dallas chapter of people who do that. And they said, well, I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to post this job and I'm going to make it to you, available to you first. So you can post it to your members. So there you go. Now this job is for, for a while, for a few days, maybe, maybe a week is only known to a small number of people, okay? Not known to the general public. And then eventually it lands on, ends up on their webpage or it ends up on Indeed. And now everybody knows about it. So it's posted, but for a period of time, it was not posted. It was only available to a select number of people. And of course you wanna be one of those select number of people. And so that's a job that's hidden for a week or two. And if you can find out it, about it in advance, then you tapped into the hidden job market. And your path to that is these people you make who you have something in, the people you meet who you have something in common with who become your supporters or your connections. So that's how you find the hidden job market. But it would be even better if you, you know, kind of proactively pursued this. So 
developing an advantage by having connections in several companies that may be interesting to you. And so that starts with making a list of target companies. And uh, Walt's gonna mention this, we're not gonna talk a lot about it, but there's some presentations uh, from Mike Ray and Chip Lipson in particular that will tell you how to find your target companies, but you need to be, you know, you're trying now uh, with purpose to uh, build supporters and champions inside companies and you identify the target companies. You ask when you meet people, you, your ask is of them is do they know someone or perhaps know someone who knows someone who works at this company or, you know, you might mention a couple of companies. It's a very simple ask uh, because just about, you know, anybody you meet who's not, you know, they may not, you may not have that much in common, but if you give them a simple ask, they may respond to that, right? The simpler, the better. So you're just asking for a name. That's all you know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who works at, um, uh, you know, EDS. I don't think EDS exists anymore. How about HPE? <laughs> HPE Enterprises or National Data or Toyota. Uh, and so once you get that name, now you wanna set up an informational interview. And so through your informational interviews, you're going to be seeking advice and feedback. There's, I think there's only one rule about informational interviews is you don't ask for a job, okay? You're seeking advice and feedback and you're gaining through that information and insight about the company. Now, along the way, you're gonna get these names, you're gonna call these people, you may find you have something in common, okay? And it's probably more likely that you have something in common if they work in an area that you're interested in or for a company that you'd be happy to go to work for. Uh, it's more likely that you do have something in common professionally. And so they, they can also, some of those will not you know, be able to help you that much and not all that interested in helping you, but more than a few will likely become connections or supporters of your cause to get inside the company. And this, we hear about this all the time uh, in the pit crew where people have made some contact with somebody they didn't know before inside the company and that's kind of paved the way for their candidacy. And Walt's gonna talk all about how you do this and uh, what you ask for and how you approach the uh, target company, the target person you want to talk to, to the hidden job market and uh, much more uh, targeted and purposeful than just meeting people and hoping that they have something you're interested in or they work. Now, it comes time, you've done this, you've done some informational interviewing uh, with, against, you know, with your list of target companies, you have a few uh, connections inside these organizations and a job description comes up that looks good for you, okay? Now, before you'd done this informational interviewing, you would just apply, you put your information into the applicant tracking system black hole, and you had about a 2% chance of being contacted through that effort. But, you know, really not much effort and really not much return. And so instead, since you now have a connection or two or three inside this company, you can decide who you want to reach out into the company and say, um, Kent, would you refer me or, you know, I'm interested in this position. It looks like a good match for me. Would you like to be the one who refers me into the company? Now, a lot of times employees get a, a bonus for this. And uh, if, if it goes all the way to being hired. And so some of them are quite eager to do this and can make uh, some good money. So uh, now you're not even going through the ATS, okay? You're gonna ask the employee to take your resume and drop it off with the recruiter or maybe even the hiring manager. Although, um, yeah, maybe even the hiring manager, okay? And uh, now you become a second degree connection to the internal recruiter or a second degree connection to the hiring manager, right? Because an employee, someone they know has referred you. And in that case, where you have a contact inside the organization, even if it's the recruiter, you have about a 50% chance, you know, one out of two, 50% chance of being contacted. But there's even more advantage. I call that the fast lane, okay? You, and I've, I've seen 
there, there was a story in the pit crew where someone applied for a job and four or five months went by and they ran into somebody they used to work for, uh, used to work with. And they found out that that person worked at the, where they had applied, okay? So they asked, you know, would you, you know, sponsor, you know, I applied five months ago, would you uh, sponsor me? Would you let, you know, the recruiter know that I'm a good match for this job? And within hours, they received a call from the recruiter and, uh, you know, were ushered into the uh, queue, right, to be interviewed for this job because they moved from the ATS black hole to now a referred uh, candidate and things, you know, things started to happen immediately. So that's, that's the way it can work. Um, but now there's even more to be gained by informational interviewing because you, know, you get into the fast lane, you go right uh, to the hiring manager to a screening interview, but the information that you gain through your informational interviews gives you insight and knowledge that other candidates may not have. It's likely other candidates don't have. And so that makes you a more effective interviewer. You know things and have insight that other candidates don't have. You can be much more confident in explaining how you can help, you know, based on the information and insights you gained in your informational interviews. And that will shorten your job search significantly. So there you are and interviewing effectively and then starting your new job. And then, oops. And then leaving stage left with the checkered flag. There we go. So that's the big picture. I hope this has helped you understand uh, informational interviews, where they fit in, target companies, how they help, and how you can use the information you gain to inform your interviewing and shorten your job search. And by the way, if it, you know, if it doesn't work out, one of these cycles doesn't work out, you know, you have other circles like this going at different companies, you know, uh, waiting for the opportunity to arise for a good position that you can be referred into. Well, you're up. All right. So what have we learned so far? So in summary, we say, well, for the posted jobs, about a third of them are done by recruiters, internal, external. A lot of, of our job postings going to the black, uh, our applications going to the black hole. It's a, like a 2% return on that. So we've learned that uh, job posting is a part of the way to go, but not very much time to be spent there. Do not limit ourselves to job postings only. Uh, that's kind of a subtle message in coming out and saying, hey, wait a minute. Maybe I want to find a company where I want to work and a job that I'd like to do, but it doesn't, it's not posted. But let me find out what's going on in the company. Maybe they need my help and need my assistance. And so don't let the fact that there's a job not posted stop us because there's a lot of jobs that are posted internally, but not externally yet. And that's that hidden job market. So why don't we chase that market instead? So kind of keep our, our ideas open about how we're going to find employment, find that work, find the job that we want in the place where we want to do it. So that's kind of summarizing that. So let's get into some of the specifics about information or interviews, which is probably the strongest and best tool to use in accomplishing that fact of getting you into that particular position quicker. So couple of questions for you. And so I've asked Jeff if he'll pull up a poll. So how many days a week do you spend applying online? Those people on uh, Facebook, please just uh, enter your, you can just enter, enter A, B, C, D, E, or F in the uh, comment field.
really all the way across the board here. Uh, we've got about two thirds responding so far. Looks like we're about done. So, uh, Jeff, can they see the poll results? You're showing them to everyone. Can everybody see the poll results? Can anybody see the poll results? <laughs> okay, thank you. I got a couple of thumbs up. I, I uh, see it. So, uh, so here's what we see. Uh, four of us say I do about less than uh, one day a week. Uh, some do, we got about eight, 30%, a third almost doing one to two days, about another third doing two to three days. Uh, three to four days, it drops down considerably. Uh, then we get into the four to five days, it's really not that much that not, not many people are doing that. And then after five days, there's a few people that are spending time in that. Now, I can almost tell you who answered A, B, C, D, E, F, how long you've been in the job search. <laughs> Because there is kind of a process where, uh, okay, well, let me get out there and take those posted jobs and start applying because that's the easy way to do it. I'm very active. I'm busy. I'm doing things. I'm trying to make progress. And then we learn it's not working out so well. And then we get into some other avenues and say, well, maybe I need to change what I'm doing and do something a little differently. So the purpose for Mark and I to talk about information interviewing today is to help you shorten that job search and say, here. Here's something you, you can do to help do that. And then we've got some concerns about doing it. Some of us are not really happy about doing it. So what, let me ask another poll. So let's go to the second poll. It says, um, let's see, do I just close this? Yeah, I close this. So the next poll is how many days per week do you spend networking or I-N-E, information of interviewing or creating connections or finding new people, uh, scheduling time to schedule uh, conversations with people, all that's included in the general field of networking, which will help you actually do your informational interviews. Well, these answers are also indicators of how long you've been searching too. It's not a fail safe. I mean, it's not a perfect, but some of us uh, start networking and informational interviewing uh, very early in the process. Not everyone waits till later. Okay, about a third, uh, less than a day. A small amount number. One person does uh, one to two days. We got five people doing two to three, six people doing three to four, about a fourth of the group. Then uh, two and two each for four or five or greater than five days, all right? So I don't have this poll, but I would ask you uh, just a question for you to answer yourself. How many days should you spend networking? Because <laughs> we all know and have the intellectual capability to understand that networking is better, but there are some barriers and reasons that we don't do it. So we'll talk about that too. Okay, thank you for sharing your information and participating in those polls. So before we do an informational interview, we need to prep, all right? That kind of goes without saying, but I say it anyway. I love it when somebody says, oh, Here's, I'm going to introduce to you a person who needs no introduction. Well, okay, well, don't introduce them then. But preparation for information. How can we go through these kind of list of things where I hit my mouse and it just goes crazy? First of all, in your introduction, if you want to meet someone, tell them, what would you tell them? What would you say up front? Uh, and, and if you're just casually meeting somebody and they were to ask you, you know, what do you do? Well, this would be what you want to have to answer that question, this unique selling proposition, that's what uh, Jack Beck's term is, he's a career coach, uh, but it's also your unique value proposition. So uh, I help people gain skills and confidence for successful hiring interviews, all right? A sentence, not too many words, something specific 
And it kind of tells you what I do and what the results of what I do are. So it's how I help in that phrase. And so I'm a big fan of I am, I do, I help. If you've heard anything about the interviewing side, you know those three terms from me. Anyway, something that you can say to gain attention, uh, to tell people something, give them context, and also to be different than other people. So that unique selling proposition over life. Always need to have your resume handy and your bio handy, all right? It's not that you want to throw resumes in anybody's face. In fact, the bio, I think, is the better tool for your informational interviews to use and have ready for those. Uh, does it say I'm looking for a job? Informational interviews are not meant to say I'm looking for a job and I want you to help me find a job. It's to help you find the information out that would help you get a job. It's more than that. And so, uh, it, but it can morph, okay? Uh, so they might wanna ask you for your resume later as you go through this process. And so you wanna have these handy. Uh, if you're uh, meeting face-to-face, person-to-person, you've got these somewhere on you. And online, of course, you can always send something to someone via online. You have to have your attributes and achievements inventory, which is how you can help. What can I do for you? What are the things that I am uh, accountable to? what I'm responsible for, but, in, in, but if I speak in terms of, uh, I, I help increase revenue, I like to save customers, I like to do these types of things, what are the attributes and your achievements? Who am I and what can I do? So that's an I am and I help side. What am I like? I need to be prepared to describe that to people, even though in the information interview that might not come up, but you need to have that preparation in case it does, because some of these things can change. You have your references. If you don't have your references prepared and ready because the results of an informational interview that might morph into a right interview, you, they might want to contact a reference to talk about something. So you should have your references ready and available in case they come up. It's too late if somebody says, I want to talk with one of your references and you don't have any. And then your prioritize target industries and companies. So that given, I thought I spelled that right, but corrected that the last time, I still haven't got it. So your prioritize target industry and companies. Uh, I would strongly suggest, and uh, Jeff, uh, if you'll put that into the chat window, that you look at the session that Jeff's recorded for Kip Lipson and Mike uh, Ray and uh, Mark alluded to it earlier on reference solutions. It's a tool to help you find and vet target companies. So I strongly recommend you do that. Most of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today assumes that you've done that and you have target companies and you have people that you are targeting. Uh, you can't just get into a conversation without uh, having something in mind about what you're looking for. And then you can research your potential connections. So who are the people I need to talk to? Uh, what do I need to know about them? And so LinkedIn is a great place to find out that information. One of the strongest things you're looking for on LinkedIn is a common connection, something in common between you and that person. It might be knowing someone in common. It might be you went to the same school, but it's finding something in common. That builds a connection. And I'll talk about contacts and connections in a few minutes. There's also a piece of software out there called crystalnose.com that actually analyzes a person's uh, LinkedIn page and comes out and tells you about their person and how you deal with them and some things like that. Is anybody online that has used Crystal Nose and could speak a short sentence or two about it? Okay, I assume not. But take a look at that. Uh, there is a one, you can do one for free, but from the information that we've heard and from the person that we found out who lives out in Phoenix, I can't remember her name, but uh, she has used it and said, it's really good. And she analyzed Jeff and Jeff thought it was uh, 80, 85%, if I remember right, uh, on track of that. So that's a possibility for you to use on people to get prepared. Remember that we're always on stage. We're never not networking. We're networking right now. You're participating. 
Now, uh, whose face do I see uh, on the screen? And I've got limited view right now, but when I see everybody's face on the screen, I'm making uh, some information, some connections, some uh, assumptions about you, all right? There are those of you that, that show uh, your, uh, your virtual screen, I mean, your, your cell phone screen, and other of you uh, turn off your visual. And so I suggest that you get to the point where you feel good about turning on your visual so that you can see and others can see you too. That's gonna be, I think, a better help for you. So I know there's reason sometimes for you not to do it, but I suggest if you can get to that point, it would probably be better for you. Then the information interview targets. There are sometimes unplanned, then there's the plan. The unplanned don't happen as often as the plan, the ones that we target, the ones that we go after. So who are the people that have the information we see? So every informational interview that you have, you should have a specific amount or data or information about what you want to find out. It's not just, uh, I'm gonna just go in and talk to somebody. Somebody said the question is, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody, but we kind of ran out of stuff. And how, you know, what, what is it I can do? Well, you might meet people. So if you have that, that uh, value proposition and talk about what you do, but you wanna talk about them. You talk about them first. So who are those people? Or those people who know the people who have the information we see. So that's getting a referral, just like we might do for interviewing for a job. So who are the people inside of the target companies inside the target industry segments? So some people don't have to be in the industry or in the company, but we're just looking for some information that other people can help us with because they are an expert or they have a lot of knowledge about that. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, inside the company or inside that industry. Just a note, you've heard of the six degrees of separation, which says at most you're six people away from finding any person in the world, which is an amazing, amazing number and statistic. What's even more amazing to me is that two links have a 50% chance of success. So if you're asking for people to find somebody in a company, if that's your situation, and you ask both for the first and second degree connections, which is, do you know someone, or maybe you know someone who at, at this particular company that might know someone there. So then you're getting the first and second degree. If you ask a person, do you know anybody, uh, they'll think and that they'll limit their answer to uh, do they know somebody or not. But if you say, do you know somebody who might know somebody, you have really widened your possibilities and chances of success. Networking is relationship. -y. That's my term for it. it it's helping others. Uh, it, it seems a little one-sided sometimes. It says, oh, I'll start my uh, uh, informational interviews and do all my networking tasks uh, now that I need help, all right? Now that I want to contact somebody that I haven't contacted in years, but now I need help, so I'll call them. You know? uh, the only thing that people don't do that are kids when they want some money. They don't wait. They just come ahead and ask. We don't have to worry about them. So what's a contact? What's a connection? I'm going to define a contact, someone we know little about. Basically, it's someone we don't know much. And they may not, may not know much about us, but we don't know much about them. Now, some people, there's a lot of people that I meet that know something about me through the interview success workshop. And they know my coaching, they've experienced it, and they do that. And I know a little bit about them, okay? I've seen their job description, perhaps, so their resume. And so I know a little bit, but I'm gonna tell you, I can't remember all of those. I just can't. But if someone were to talk to me and say, hey, I went through your workshop, we've got an instant connection. So who are the people that we want to develop into a connection? So what's a connection? So I would suggest we do this. We want to look at who knows us. You know, it used to be uh, who you know, but today it's who knows you, right? The ones that know you are better able to represent you to others. So I suggest we rate them first by knowledge about us. Do they know our character, do they know our experience, and our value? Do you know I am, I do I am? What, what parts of that do they know? If it's high, 
that would mean they have significant knowledge. Medium would have some, and low says well, a little knowledge. So I look at all my contacts and see how do they become a connection? Which ones are connections? And I rate them this way. Now there's a second rating I want to do is how willing are they to help us? Uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge about us, but they're, they're not willing to help. So we have to figure out and find out how will they help us and how much. Of course, those that are happy to help are, are high on the list. So you get they get a one. And so the medium provides some and the lows provide none. So how can I tell if somebody might be happy to help? I'll give you one example. I go out to LinkedIn and so I'm looking at Patty and I look at her and I see uh, she, she, she has been out of a job in the last two or three years or last couple of years. She's been looking for a job. You know that people who've been looking for a job uh, in the last year or two are a lot more willing to help other people who are looking for a job as well. If a person has worked in a company for many years and it doesn't look like they haven't been looking for a job, in general, that doesn't mean they don't, but in general, they're not as able or willing to help us. But those who have been unemployed for a little while will generally be glad to help us each. So I'm looking for the A1s, all right? So once we get them, uh, we have, have the people, then we can focus on a prioritized list Looks like we want to spend more time on the A1s you know, and the A2s. Then we go to the B1s, the B, et cetera. And once we get that, we can start working on it. But remember, we still want to continue expanding our network, expanding our connections. So that's a continual process. We don't just do it for a little while and stop and keep adding names going on. How do you add a name? You build relationships. So let's talk about referrals. So somebody's giving you a referral and say, uh, hey, uh, you ought to talk to Mark. He knows about how to help you uh, discuss and, and answer the question, why did you leave your last job? He's, he's an expert on that. He's really good at it. All right. So the referral source might just say, uh, yeah, just call Mark and tell him uh, Walt sent you. OK. And you get that kind of response. So that's called a cool call. Now, the warm call has a good, better, and best than the warm. The good is uh, where I send Mark an email and say, hi, I know Patty, and she's interested in finding out about your coaching on why you left your last job. Would you be willing to talk to her? All right? And I get a response back from Mark. Then I send an email to Mark and to Patty, and I say, want to introduce you to each other? Patty, you're, I know you're interested in why you want to leave your last job, and Mark is interested in helping you do that. And then I kind of step back and take it away, all right? And so that's better. I, I get a meeting between you, and I get a, a trilateral meeting is where I'll say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, so we're, we're in a room now where we get, we're back face to face, and we're talking about something. And I say, wait a minute. Uh, come over here. Let me get you meet, to meet Mark. And I pull you across the room and say, here's Mark. Mark does this kind of thing. You mentioned you were looking for some help with that, that you had some issues and concerns about how to answer that question. And I introduce you right there on the spot, all right? That's really good. So it's a lot easier to do. We're meeting back face to face, but we can still do that online some. And the hot call is when I call Mark and say, Mark, Patty's in just talking to you. He says, okay. And he calls Patty right away. He doesn't wait for Patty to call. He calls him. So, that, that's a hot call. Uh, there are a couple of people out there that I've met that I've referred to. Then I sent them an email back and said, how'd it go? I said, uh, have you talked? He said, oh yeah, I've already called them. I've already talked to them. So he reaches out to the people immediately. And guess what? He was looking for a job for about a year, not too long ago. Perseverance is required. Uh, the job search can be uh, up and down as you well know. Uh, you get negatives, you get no's, you, you, you do things, and it's kind of like the funnel. Some are successful and some are not. It's like the sower, or the parable of the sower of the seed. Some fall among the thorns, some don't grow, but some fall in the fertile ground. And if you nurture them, they will grow. So that's the thing that we have to look at is perseverance. But let's step back a minute. What is in the informational interviewing anyway? 
So what I would say is uh, from the definition that I have here, it's a meeting where you initiate to gain additional knowledge from a person that's got the experience, all right? It's not a job interview because we're interviewing, right? And the ball's in our court as to its content and to its flow. So in job search, we have a meeting featuring a conversation about our career, company, or industry. We wanna find something out about those three things between you and someone who may be able to help you get that job in the future directly or indirectly. Directly, they know someone in the company. Indirectly, they may know somebody who knows somebody. Or they may suggest somebody else you can talk to, those kinds of things. So that's what we're looking at, just the basics. I think you all understand and know that. But one of the basic advantages and positive things about it is we get to go to the front door into a targeted company. Now, I have a tough time saying, is it the front door or the back door? <laughs> Because people, I think, think the front door is applying to a job. And so, okay, if that's your definition, then we're going to use the back door. But I call applying for a job really the back door because it's so unproductive and that this is the front door. So a little semantics lesson from what I think about these words. And it's also a way, really, uh, well, did I miss that? There we go. I'm having to move some things around. A way to build a mutually beneficial relationship. So our objective with information on interviewing is to build that relationship, right? We build a relationship first before we ask for help. That's a key thing. So when we're talking to people, we want to talk about them. We want them to tell us some things. And so we're interested in them, get that, getting them talking about that then they will turn and then ask something you well, tell me about you, or tell me what you're doing or whatever it might be. But you let them talk first because you wanna find out something about them, you wanna mention something, maybe you see something in common, whatever it might be. But it, you don't build a relationship with just you talking. You've got to have them talking. So I always suggest we let them talk first and find out about that first in your questions. So why do we do it? Well. We might want to look uh, to somebody to get an assessment of, you know, how, where do you think we still, uh, where I stand? Uh, I'm looking to do this. Would you think I can accomplish that? Or what do I need to do to, it takes to accomplish that? And what skills do I need? All right. Uh, is my strategy correct? Uh, what do you think about my resume? A lot of people are wanting to get a lot of feedback on resumes. I just wonder how much time you spend on resumes versus how much time you spend on practice interviewing, right? And so, we spend an awful lot of time on resumes. I don't know, sometimes you were on version 37 or whatever. So while I'm on the subject, I suggest you have a master resume and then you pull that in and say, this one I'm gonna tailor. I'm just gonna take off a few bullets. I'm going to reorder maybe a couple of things in priority. And it's gonna say really the same thing that's on LinkedIn, but it's gonna be shorter than what's on LinkedIn. But it'll still be the same type of stuff. To be Consistent, that's very important to be consistent. So I wanna find out about a company or an industry or the competition or the products or the services. I'm looking to just to gain information so I can go in, particularly if I'm changing industries. So I'd really like to talk to some people in that industry to learn the lingo, to learn what's important, what's going on, what are the trends and things like that. So that when I'm talking to people, I can talk intelligently about that industry. So let me arm myself, do my research, do my homework, so that when I get into the real interview, I can talk about that industry as an example. Well, that's also to find out if we want to work there. So you've got a, you're interested in the company, so you're still in the vetting process. Looks like it's pretty good. So let me talk to somebody in there and find out what it's like to work there. All right. So that's one of the things. What are the problems, challenges, issues that face? And that's a really good thing to talk about to a person internally because you might be able to help them with some of those things. Understanding the culture is pretty important. Well, I think it's extremely important if you're trying to vet a company and if the culture doesn't match, forget it. Just don't go there because nothing else is going to matter. So finding out about those things, do a match, does they occur between us and the company? And let's find out what it's really like working in a certain place. I talked to a pharmacist she said, uh, the stress, the strain, uh, the pressure of being a pharmacist is just too much. Now, I'm amazed at what pharmacist knowledge have with chemistry. I mean, 
I never figured out chemistry. You put these two things on the left and you put an arrow and these things happen on the right. And I never understood how to put the stuff on the right. It was, it was terrible, but they know an awful lot. And she was very unhappy. She sells dresses in a boutique and is extremely happy. She's really fine what she wants to do. So one of the really realities, I also remember when I was in uh, college and I went to my dentist, I thought about being a dentist. So I asked the dentist if I could talk to him one day and talk about, I said, oh yeah, yeah, come on in. And we made an appointment. I was in his office and we talked for about 30 minutes and I learned I didn't want to be a dentist. <laughs> so it, it, that, those kind of things can help and people are willing to help you. They really are. Expand your professional network, all right? So you always want to be expanding your information and contacts and connections, all right? Who might become a resource? Continue building that and improving your interview skills, your industry knowledge, confidence, all that information. It was on Mark's uh, circular diagram of saying, when you get information and go through that information, interviewing and gain that knowledge and skills and abilities to be able to talk about better things, when you get into the real interview, it's going to help you with that. Make a big difference. And of course, uncover new job opportunities that aren't accessible to you as an outsider. So that's that hidden job market. Um, go into a company that you like, find out what's going on. They may not have a job posted, but through your conversation with them and you start talking about you a little bit of how you can help them do these kinds of things, that can go into say, well, we might wanna have some further conversations and talk to you about working here. Of course, we wanna learn what our peers with the traits and skills like ours have done. So what's going on in your world? How, how, it seems like we have these things in common. Uh, what's been your background? What's your history? Where are you hit? All that sort of thing. So that's another way of looking at it. Understand what's most important to employers. So if you're talking to the company, people in the company that you're interested in, what's the most important things to them? We want to be able to address those and find out what they are. It'd be great to have all this knowledge before the interview, right? And of course, apply our knowledge to do a better resume and make a, a, a more positive impression during the job interview. And I should have put this one first, probably, is discover what you can do for them. Uh, a sentence about that. Have any of you been told by someone said, well, listen, if you need anything, let me know. Uh, bet you have. Now, how many of you have needed something and called them? I bet you haven't. Therefore, let's not do that. That's not, that's not offering assistance. That's not helping at all. But discovering what we can do for them is. So we don't know what to do. We don't know how to help them. Whatever. Well, let's find out. So that's in that informational interview. When you find out what's going on, you may discover some things. And you're looking for things you can discover. This like, okay, maybe I can help them with that. Maybe put them in touch with somebody or send them an article or do something like that. What can you do for them? It's not just, uh, when I was in leadership and I was talking with the group and I said, what do you do if one of your employees has a death in the family? Do you go to the funeral? And several people said, no, you, know, you don't go to the funeral. I said, well, why not? And I kind of worked, worked down a path of saying, are you telling me your employees are not important enough to you to go to their family funeral? <laughs> and everybody ends up saying, we should go. We should do that, all right? It's kind of like this, find out and discover what the needs are. Don't just say, can I help you? Or what is it I can do? If you can, you certainly can ask that question. Offering is good, it gives you something to just at least offer it. it. says, I would love to be of help to you. Is there anything I can do for you? All right, but let's go further than that and discover what the needs are. Then that makes a lot better because I mean, I always like it when if you give a birthday present to somebody and they say, how did you know I wanted one of these? Okay. They're very impressed that you knew something about them that they would like that sort of thing. Other than, oh, a tie. Thank you so much. <laughs> right? And build rapport and make that connection. So we want to build contact into a connection, to have that rapport with them through that conversation and to get a potential referral. So, now we talk about some of the reasons or a little bit about why we don't do informational interviews. So I'm gonna call earlier, 
So I picked out uh, about five different things here that some of the barriers that I hear people telling me that uh, stops them from doing an informational interview. So I'm not ready, I'm not connected, I'm not good at it, it's difficult to ask for help, and maybe there's something else. And so if you have something that's not those four, please don't drop it into the chat window. And Mark and Jeff, if you would kind of monitor that, because I don't have a chat window up right now. Okay, we've got about half here going through it. About a third, 30% or so saying, you know, I'm not ready yet. Uh, for those of you that are not ready yet, are you ready to get ready? <laughs> All right, that'd be my question to you. So I'm not connected enough, okay? Are you ready to start building your connections would be the situation for uh, choice B. Uh, I'm not good at networking. Okay, are you ready to start practicing and start getting better at doing networking through your informational interviews, right? Uh, it's difficult to ask for help. Okay, let me address that one uh, briefly. Uh, Patty, I'm kind of choosing you because I can see you a little bit. <laughs> how do you feel, and you can open your mic and answer this question, how do you feel if I come to you and say, Patty, I understand that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pick a field that you're in that you know you you've been in retail for quite a while, and you know a lot about retail. And I'm really interested in talking to you. Would you be willing to uh, spend some time with me and see if uh, maybe I should be you know the retail industry would be good for me? All right. So that's the question. So my question to you now, Patty, is how do you feel? Sure, I can help you. All right. But how do you feel? about the retail just how do you feel how did that question and that request make you feel talk about an emotion it felt fine okay it neutral wasn't, it wasn't persuasive or mean or anything okay well i'm looking at the idea of saying that if someone asks me for help i'm kind of impressed because they want to hear what i have to say sure I mean, you know, in our jobs, anybody ever feel overutilized? Yes. <laughs> and we feel probably underutilized. We probably can, you know, do more than they're asking us to do. Is anybody yet really interested in your opinion about things? <laughs> Not too often, right? Mm -hmm. But when somebody comes up to you and says, I'm really interested in what you have to say, and I value your opinion and your ideas and your information, I think you're gonna get a lot of people who would really enjoy helping you. Sure. All right? So if that's true and you're like that, then why don't we ask people? So here's my statement. We need to learn how to let people help us, <laughs> right? Because we feel we, we just, it's just difficult, all right? I, I don't like doing that. But you've got so many people out there that are willing to help and would like to help and want to help. So let's, we're doing a good thing for them by letting them help us. Mm -hmm. They feel better. They feel good about it. So why don't we approach it that way instead of the concern about asking for help? Okay, so that's the end of the uh, poll. Thank you very much. Ah, how to gain confidence. Don't be afraid to ask. And I've got a little bit more on that. Do some research, prepare your questions, keep it short, follow up, All right? You don't walk into a informational interview or even a choice meeting without having that preparation that I talked about earlier. So you've got that research. Now, if you have a specific area that you wanna talk about, 
which is what you should have for any particular informational interview, a specific target, a specific amount of information. You may have two or three topics, but they're specific, all right? So that when you're talking to them, so I'm interested in talking to you about these things, all right? Something very specific. And then you have a list of questions that says, here's how I can find out what I'm looking for. Here's my four or five questions, whatever that I can say, find out if this is the right thing for me, or if this is I'm headed in the right direction, or if I'm getting good information about the industry or whatever your target information is in that informational interview. Keep them short, all right? And I'll show you how to do that. But we, whatever time frame we set, we want to keep to it. And then follow up. Follow up is really critical because thank you notes, I suggest you send thank you notes to anyone who helps you, anyone. Anyone sends you a suggestion, a thank you note. Here's something that I don't get back very much when I'm send out information to people and say, here's a connection you might want to talk to or whatever it might be that go through that process is I never hear back from them. They don't, they don't come back and say, yeah, I had a conversation, talk to them. Uh, it was good or bad or didn't work or I learned this or whatever it might have been. And so it would be nice when we follow up with someone who has helped us to tell them they helped us and what was it about it that you did to help them. That makes us feel good. Anytime I talk to say, Patty, you know, I did talk with, the, with Mark about the, uh, the why you left your last job. He was a great help to me. Thank you so much for introducing me to Mark. All right, that kind of thing, that kind of feedback. And then always, how can I help you? So we're always asking how we can help. All right, a few other benefits, exposure, visibility, increased confidence and referrals. So we get ourselves known. We're letting people know that we're looking for work through this process. If you don't let them know, then they can't help us. Sometimes we feel, well, it's not, I don't like to let people know that I'm unemployed and it bothers me. Well, <laughs> get over it. <laughs> just get, get a feeling inside that says people do want to help you. Just letting them know. Uh, Mark mentioned a story. I have a story about the person that was in a, uh, I think it was a, a food kitchen to, for a nonprofit. And she said, gee, I was wanting to get into the George Bush Foundation. And I had an interview with him, but uh, it didn't work out. And the woman she was talking to said, oh, you should have told me. We vacation with the Bushes every year. Okay. And here's this connection. Well, if you just let somebody know, right, it's all you had to do. Visibility. You can get on the short list. Uh, Mark mentioned the story of getting into the part where uh, in an hour or two, he got a call. People will put you at the top of the list if somebody is your champion or refers you, so, or you go right to the top of the list. They rather do that because that's easier. It gives me a feeling of easier confidence that this may be a person else rather than going through the hard part of trying to match up keywords on resumes through my job descriptions and stuff like that with the applicant tracking system. It's a lot longer, harder work. This is better and confidence. So the more you talk with people, the more informational interviews you have, the better you are prepared and then confident in the job interview. And so always you want to build rapport and continue making connections so you can give and get referrals. All right, let's talk just a bit about the informational interview itself. So your opening says, I want to introduce myself. And what's the purpose of the meeting? What am I trying to achieve? What am I want to do here? All right. Very specific as to what you're trying to do. I have personal uh, questions about whether it's person, company, competitors, industry, some knowledge in a specific area, whatever it is that you're targeting. I have questions ready for the, that particular thing. And then when I close, I'm going to ask a couple of things. So, so do you know anyone else I should talk to? right? I mean, it's always good to talk with somebody and see if you can't get one or two referrals to other people about maybe whatever came up in that interview. So chase it down. If you're looking for a particular position, 
uh, in a company and you've had a talk says, well, do you, are you aware of any positions that might fit the needs that you talked about? Uh, another question you might ask is, do you know anyone else who would be willing to talk to me? That's the same thing as any others I should talk to, I guess. And is there something I can do to help you? Now, I'm looking for an answer. I'm not looking for uh, just an offer, although you might not get anything. But if through that conversation, you determined there was a need there, it might be say, you know, we talked about this. I might be able to help you with that. I know a person or I know I'll have some information about. Can I send that to you? Whatever it is, that would even be stronger. So close it. Stay within the time limit. Our time is up. I want to honor your time. I am available if you'd like to talk further, but stay to your time limit. Be prepared to answer questions about your search. It can turn to you and it can go back and the interview changes and they're the interviewer and now you are the candidate. Have your research, business card, I mean your resume, your biography, business cards, have that information handy. You know what's good about a business card? is getting theirs. <laughs> it's kind of like, we don't care a whole lot what they do with ours, but I have theirs. I have their contact information. Uh, so when we ever get back face to face, that'll have a lot more say. And then be prepared because it could morph into a job interview and do that follow-up that we talked about, all right? Try to benefit your contact in some way before you ask for help, i.e. build a connection first, right? Build a connection first before you ask. That way, that's some of the reason why we don't want to ask for help is because we haven't built a relationship, we haven't done something. But if you help somebody else, Irma Bombeck says, you know, that's the gift, the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I owe you back. If you've helped me, I want to help you back. Uh, that's kind of the, the nature of, of ourselves today and our personalities that, that we do. People that help me, I kind of want to help them back. So help them. It's not a technique. It's because you want to build a connection. This is important. This is somebody you want to have a relationship with. This is somebody you want to help. The more people you help, the greater the return you're going to be getting help. And then you prepare some scripts. And I'll give you a short example. Now, this one assumes you've done your research and you've done your targeting and all that sort of thing. You just don't walk in and say this <laughs> at the beginning. So well, I'm in the process of making some career decisions and maybe your advice would be extremely helpful. Try to learn about these things and your insight and experience would be very important as I make this decision. So I only need about 20 minutes. Can we set up a meeting for next Tuesday or Wednesday? So the key words in this particular one is, what are you specifically looking for? Career decisions. What do you want from them? Their advice. Advice is a nice word to use. I'm looking for your opinion, your information. I seek your advice. I think it's important to hear what you have to say. And you're telling them that your insight and experience. Why do I think you are the person that should be given this information? What's, what's important about that? It's telling them that you value them. Here's why you value them and why you're going, willing to listen to them. Makes me feel good when you say, gee, Walt, you know a little bit about interviewing. I appreciate that. And then you give in that time, but you don't say what's to have lunch one day. That doesn't work. Because anybody that says you want to have lunch one day said, okay, when you want to have it, let's put it on the counter. Let's get it scheduled. So can we set up a meeting? Uh, be specific, be targeted. Here's about requesting a referral. And this is kind of a generic way of setting it up. So I'm Fred Johnson, and how do I know about them? And is there anything we have in common? I'm interested in, here's what I'm seeking. I'm looking for, I'm going to describe a person. If I'm looking for a person that says that would have this kind of knowledge, who might provide this specific information, whatever I'm, whatever specific, and on any additional. So everything that's underlined is something you got to fill in, right? When, with, with your with your uh, why I value them, I believe you might know the kind of people. So who do you know? Uh, I'm going to skip over this one because you can come back and look at the video that's going to be put on YouTube afterwards just to shorten the time frame. But another example of how you might request a referral. So I'm going to throw in a few scripts so that you can get some ideas of how to say because scripting it out is going to help you. So suppose a contact then provides a referral. 
So once a name is provided, we want to do a little bit more. Well, how do you know them? In other words, what's the relationship between you and that person? All right. Uh, what's the reason that you think that that person would be a good contact? So we're doing a little due diligence on the connection to find out. So what kind of information would they have? What kind of expertise do they have? How should I contact them? Would you be willing to contact them first? Uh, may I use your name when I call them? Who else do you think I should talk to? So these, the, I'm not listing these. You don't ask all of these. You just choose the ones that are appropriate in the situation to say, you know, which ones should I find out about? But basically, find out about the connection. Find out something about from that person. So I'm looking to gauge the relationship between the person I'm talking to and their connection. Strong relation, oh, we worked together for years, means something different. Than, oh, yeah, uh, well, my wife knows them, all right, or my husband knows them, or somebody else. So find out what that is. How can I be of assistance to you? Always asking people how you can help. So if they don't provide a referral, well, still we're going to thank them anyway, but we can still ask some questions and say, well, is there any advice you can give me on my next steps? A very generic, open-ended question. Any advice how I might find out the information I'm looking for? What would you do if you were in my shoes? Something that says, uh, help me or uh, guide me through uh, where I can go get this information. If you don't have it, where might I find it? And I still appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And how can I be of assistance to you? So here's another one with a referral. And you can read that as you go through and look at the uh, video because I'm, like, I'm going to stop soon. So the keywords, career decisions, valuable advice, brief meeting, advice, insight. So I would suggest you take these keywords and say, all right, I want to use these keywords in whatever I'm talking about. So I highlight those. Those are the ones that I suggest that you have include in your informational interview request. All right. The key to all successful information interviewing is building a relationship first, ask for assistance second, and offer to be assistance always. The real purpose is to build relationships and develop future connections, support of champions. So it's not just a one-off meeting where we're gonna find out something, it's a long lasting relationship. So look at it from the long view and say, I'm trying to cultivate new professional connections. Should you practice? Well, you should practice informational interviewing as well as you practice interviewing. So Jeff and I both have the Dallas Pit Crew and the Interview Success Workshop. And I suggest you practice your informational interviews too. You can pick a partner uh, and do that and go through that. Be glad to help. Now we can go to questions. I'm tired of talking. Uh, there you go. Well, we have, you're you're, we have, you're uh, tired of listening. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let me just mention them kind of in chronological. Well, no, we'll do that. I want to mention the ones that I think we can answer real quickly, and then we'll get to some others. So, uh, Sean asked about using LinkedIn Plus to reach out to people, and uh, any, I, I'm not sure I know about LinkedIn Plus. So, who, well, do you know the answer, Jeff? I haven't heard of LinkedIn premium. Plus, unless it's the premium. Premium, I just, perhaps. I just mean the premium because I have a lot of people on my network, but even though they could be my good friends or whatever, they read the message and don't do anything. So then I was thinking maybe I should get the premium so I can contact the person directly. Because sometimes they don't let you do that if they're if you unless you have that premium account. Yeah. Well, you can get a month free, I believe, and give it a try. Mm -hmm. uh, most people I've talked to say you don't really need the premium to accomplish these things. I guess the little hint to get around that maybe is if you're trying to find the contact and you find them, look and see what groups they're part of and then join the same group. And then once, and you may have to wait a week before they allow it, but at some point then you will be able to contact somebody else in that group directly. Great, thank you so much. That's a yeah, great I tip. Think there's, I think there's no limit on those messages either, Jeff. Is that right? As far as I know, I mean, I don't, you know, 
my LinkedIn is changing what they do every day. So yeah, you're right. True, a couple of weeks ago may no longer be true anymore. It's just you know you just sort of have to take it every day. So, but you know the other important thing is if you can get out of if you can get around LinkedIn and stop using LinkedIn, that's always the best thing. Get their email and then do it directly. Don't use right. LinkedIn if you can. And you, and Sarah, you, you also mentioned that people aren't responding. And so, I mean, that's part and parcel of this technique of reaching out to people, even if you have a referral. And so repetition helps. And, uh, you know, if you've been a salesperson, you've been taught, you know, that you might have to leave the same message three or four times before people who are interested will respond. And then, of course, people who are uninterested won't respond at all. But people who you know have a desire to help you still need to be contacted repeatedly uh, before they take action. Really, that's just the way it is, so. Something that I know that a person I know who did this and was very effective is every three weeks they would put out two different emails. One email would go to friends and family, the other one would go out to professional contacts. And it pretty much would say the same thing, the first paragraph was, I want to thank the following people for help over the last past couple of weeks. And they'd mention a few people. And you can just make up names because this is going out BCC, so nobody knows who else is on the list. And then the second paragraph is, just as a reminder, I'm looking for a position as X. This week or the next couple of weeks, I'd like to target the following companies. If you know anybody who works there, you can offer any advice and you know your opinion, I would really appreciate it. And then, you know, thank you very much. And every three weeks by doing that, you know, within a couple, I mean, the person told me within an hour or two, now the first time uh, she did it, she didn't get a lot of response, but the second, third, fourth time, within an hour or two, somebody was calling her up or emailing her and going, hey, uh, you know, here's, here's a recommendation. So. If you let people know what your target companies are and where you're trying to look and what you're trying to look for, you know, like Mark said, if you're in sales, it could take three to five times before somebody will start to get it and remember. Yeah, I just appreciate just like a no or I don't know them or something because it's amazing. Like these people I really know and are friends with, they look at it and then they just don't respond. So well, you also have to remember, too, that if they've never been out of work, they don't get what we do. They don't get what we're going through. Someday they will be out of work, and then you'll be able to teach them, and you'll show them what they should be doing. They, understand. They, they just don't know how they can help. Right, I just have one last question. Like, I tend to want to have the or thank someone before the exchange. So I think I posted that like I've offered to babysit or offered to take care of their dog or something because I don't want to just be like, you know, nagging them, but I want to do something in return, you know, as a nice favor if they're going to help me out. Well, my first suggestion is to try to get ahead of that. Help them first before you ask for help let's go ahead send them, and send them information and you know do a review of an article you know prepare very highly condensed and send it to them. you know buy information about the industry you know things they they may or may not be aware of but you know it's the thought that counts in this case What other questions were on the list? Yeah, somebody else asked um, uh, about uh, Leor asked, do companies keep resume in their your resume in their database for possible future role? And the short answer is yes. Uh, that information will stay in the database. The longer answer is you some, I think this varies by recruiter, uh, <laughs> but as Walt mentioned and I've heard as well, the easiest thing for them to do is to go to first or second degree connections. Those have a more um, possibility of converting. And, you know, some of them will go to the ATS right away, but others, you know, it's kind of the second or third thing they do after they run out of other choices. So it's in there, 
and it's available, do they go search for it? No, yeah, I don't think initially they do. Okay, I, don't, I think I don't think very many of them do initially. So. Is that it, or do we have any more questions? I think we, well, Rocky asked about, you know, runs out of questions quickly, so I think we'll address that. Um, we have one question, another question from Leora, which is not related to the networking or uh, informational interview, so we can, we can cover that one here in just a second. Does anyone else have another question? Dana at 125. Let me go, let me back up the, on the list here. Ah, okay, so Dana, look at this at 125, guys. Oh, Jeff typed this in from Facebook. Dana asked, how do you go from the information interview to having the person refer you? Are you still on, Dana? Well, so let me take a stab at this, right? So She's when, when you see a job that looks good, for, you know, so you've developed a contact or, or um, connection, uh, maybe to in a company. And so a job description you see, you know, shows up that you think is a good match. And so you're going to call them and ask them if they agree, you know, you're going to say, I see this job description and we've had this conversation. And as you recall, you know, this was my background. I think this is a good match. You know, would you be willing to sponsor me or refer me? So you're going to ask them first to help you out. They may say yes. They may, you know, say I'm not so sure that's right for you. I I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. But you know, that's how you go about it. Okay, is uh, to ask them. Just you know, ask their ask them to, to bring your information forward. And what they then they may tell you, this is how it goes. You know, I can take it to the recruiter or I can take it to the hiring manager. It may, you know, that may not be, that may be different among companies on wh how they refer you. They may even say, well, you need to apply first. And then when you apply on the ATS, you're gonna get a reference number and call me back and tell me what the reference number is. And then I can, you know, add my name to your, uh, application. So you just got to ask and find out what technique is the way to do it. You know, I think the whole key to this is you need to be doing informational interviews to find out what companies are like, what the culture is like before you see a job that you're interested in. Because if you, if you're going because you're trying to focus on a particular job, you put the cart before the horse because you've got to you've got to find out about the company. You have to build a relationship with somebody inside a company that you really think that you want to work with. Where you may do an information interview and you'll find out that I don't want to work for this company. I mean, you know, this, you know, I wouldn't recommend anybody working for this company. They burn you out. You know, they're working nonstop. Whatever it is, um, so you need to make those contacts. You know, find your target companies find people inside the company, find out about them, and then you'll, you know, then you'll be able to leverage those people when you see a job opening. I have a question for Leora. She said someone just connected me on LinkedIn this past week. Uh, did they accept or request a connection? So what it was is they um, put us on a three-way chat on LinkedIn. And the person referenced to him how they went to school together or something like that. It was nice to catch up. And then he introduced me and he left it up to us to continue the conversation. So I thanked the person who connected me and I told the person that he was connecting me to that I would love to get some guidance from him, um, advice about the company. And I would do it at his convenience to just let me know when he's available. And I never heard back. Um, my first suggestion would be to contact the referral, the person who introduced you and say, hey, I'm, I'm really interested in talking to this person. I'm not getting a response. Do you have any suggestions? Okay. That would be one thing that you could do. 
Another I, thing is it depends on what you're asking in your, your follow-up request and how you ask it. So look at the scripts about, you know, I'll value your opinion. I'll look at, I'll, I'll, I would like to talk and get, you know, use those kind of things to see if that might have a, a different reaction from it. And eventually, if you don't hear anything, you say, well, uh, this is my last request to talk to you. Uh, I would really enjoy talking to you, but, but I'm not going to bug you. I'm not going to, you know, I don't, I don't want you to uh, feel like pressure or anything like that. Or say something in the idea that's saying, I'm not going to contact you anymore. This is my last request. There are people that are saying that that gets a response more than just the normal request to say, I'm not going to request anymore. Okay, thank you. And also, one of the things I've noticed on LinkedIn lately, I used to get an email every time I had a message. Lately, I haven't been, I get an email sometimes. I've had some group chats where people have introduced me to somebody and I didn't know it except I happened to open up my messages and oh, I, here's an unread message I hadn't seen before. So it's possible that, you know, once again, there's a LinkedIn I... setting that something's happening that you, the person's not receiving an email saying that, hey, they have a new message. I, I would check your settings because I every time I get a message or a, or a, a notification, it pops up in my email. So I, I would say check your settings on the LinkedIn side because that, that part generates probably a third of the stuff hitting my mailbox. Right, right. And, and, and I get daily emails from LinkedIn. It's just that I don't, I mean, I've got other emails for messages, but this three-part one, I hadn't seen it before. I just happened to scan down and see it. So, you know, you just... And if the person's inactive on LinkedIn, they may not be getting any email. So they would maybe never see it. They may, you know, the person you know made the introduction, but the other person may not have, uh, may, may never have seen it, so. Okay, that's a good idea. I'll check to see if the person has an email on there and I'll tell the person who referred me if you can email him the same introduction and that'd probably be better. And you're right. If they didn't see the email pop up in their emails, they wouldn't know that they had something sitting in LinkedIn. I wouldn't know a lot of times either. All right. Thank you. Is that it? Anything else? Mark, was that everything? I have a new nominee for the worst ATS system on the face of the planet. <laughs> I've been sitting here. Somebody said, well, somebody done it. Uh, Plano has finally posted the position they've been talking about since the Art Beach. Well, I've been in there and I'm, they, whoever they hired to do this applicant tracking system. Oh my God. <laughs> it is something called Frontline and it is absolutely worthless. <laughs> but, but I know two people over there, so they're going to get my resume. As soon as I submit this, they're going to get my resume. Well, unfortunately, the top of the list of those systems is still bad. Uh, yeah, it's a very, worse, <laughs> this is worse it's a very fragmented market, has. too. Nobody has a big market share. But yeah, IBM has my contacts. I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, sorry. My contacts usually tell me, well, you have to apply to the company. Give me the job order number, and then yeah. I'll follow up for you. Yeah. Or they just say, put me as uh, the contact that you know in the company, and that's it. Right. Beyond that's that, they great. don't do anything else. That's great. That's what you want. Say, okay. hey, because you're going to end up having to submit and apply and all that stuff online because that's their process. But you've already gone to the top of the list because now you don't submit blindly. They're going to say, you need, you know, that somebody else, they'll alert somebody to talk to you and they'll pull you off. Right. And with my cousin in law, last week I submitted to her my resume and my cover letter. She asked for that. They were asking for people, to, uh, the employees, to have their friends submit. And I haven't heard anything back. I mean, at first she told me, she said she didn't get it and it turned out it was all in her spam. So I kept sending it until she finally realized where it was. And I don't know if I should keep bothering her now or should I apply to them? And I don't know what to do next. Perseverance. Okay. So I'll just ask her if she knows of it, you know, where it stands. Yeah. Well, I would give her a compliment before I just ask for status. I would say, you know, thank you for your offer to uh, provide assistance. I really appreciate your willingness to, to do that. And I haven't heard anything back. And what do you suggest I do next? Okay, thank you. And that's better than just saying, where does it stand? 
Of course, yeah. No, and I thanked her like that also when I submitted the resume. And you also have to remember, it's summertime. People want to get away. They may be getting away. They could be taking long weekends. They could be taking four or five day weekends. You know, people are, are <clears throat> tired of being at home. And the last thing they want to do is, you know, they're ready to get out of the office. So it may right now, the next couple months, at least till the end of August, it could take a little bit longer than normal. Okay, thank you. I just have a comment to make on this uh, value proposition. Some of you know that uh, the new hotel at Choctaw Casino I'm helping build, but they have a saying that says exclusively for everyone. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> so that's what we need, something that gets attention like that. All right, Mark, were there any other questions or was that it? Well, Kevin asked a question, but it looks like he had to drop off. So okay. Uh, he was the one who met somebody and had a nice conversation, but apparently not around work. And now he's wondering what he should do next. And uh, so if, you, if any of you have encountered that situation, this is the perfect time to forward them your biography and ask if they know someone who works at one of your target companies. Or maybe well, know someone who knows someone. <laughs> yeah, maybe you want a specific now information from any of you other than just this general meeting conversation that they had. So yeah. the relationship has been built to some degree. Yeah. Go to the next step. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you, gentlemen. Great information today. As always, uh, just as a reminder, crew, FW crew, you say we're putting on training five days a week. Coming up uh, tomorrow, we have a special guest speaker for Effective Resume Thursday. Uh, Aaron Ullitz, who's the operation director at Next Step Recruiting. He sees about 100 resumes a day. It's a, a recruiting firm. He's going to tell you what he likes about resumes. He's going to tell you what gets why, why you land up in the reject pile. And it doesn't take much to land up in the reject pile, and he'll tell you why. So uh, join us tomorrow at 1 o'clock. should be a very interesting presentation to hear from Aaron. This Friday at the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group meeting, Simplifying the job search through trust. Trust stands for five different topics. Um, five different topics. I heard this speaker a couple months ago, and I thought it was really interesting. So that's why I invited them to speak to our group on Friday. Anybody's welcome to join us. Uh, the Women of Wisdom will be meeting this uh, Friday. They meet the first and third Friday of the month. Uh, they will be meeting at noon this Friday, not at one o'clock. At noon this Friday. Uh, if you'd like the invitation, please send an email to wow at careerdfw.org, wow at careerdfw.org. Uh, next Monday, we'll have a presentation for Networking Mondays at 1 o'clock. On Tuesday, our LinkedIn presentation will be how to use LinkedIn in job hunting, strategies to get results. And then next Wednesday, for Interviewing Wednesday, difficult interviewers, questions, and cultivating confidence. So it'll be session number 12. Uh, this session has been recorded. It will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel. On the Career USA YouTube channel, it looks something like this. Uh, click on playlist is the best way to do it. And then up will come the different playlists that I've put together. Every video that I upload gets stuck into a playlist. Pick the one you want. Don't click on the video, but click down below where it says view full playlist. And then up will come a list of all the different events. Uh, in chronological order. If the newest one's not on top, click the little sort button and you'll be able to go back and watch any of these videos that you want at your leisure. If you're not receiving emails about our workshops, you'd like to join the CareerUSA mailing list, please send an email to CareerUSA, the plus sign subscribe at group.io. I'll put this email address up at the very end. Please note the CareerDFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Mark's a volunteer, Walt's a volunteer, I'm a volunteer. I've never gotten paid to do any of this over the last 13 years. We have no full or part-time employees. We survive on donations. It helps pay for Zoom, it helps pay for the web names, the web hostings, and anything I can't get donated. So please consider making a donation when you get your next opportunity so we can continue to provide the services that we're providing. So thank you for joining us today, Mark and Walt, once again, thank you very, very much. Can I plug something in here?